to a living being of truth, infinite in essence, to be in the world sure feels degrading. Stuck in a limited mind with no clear memory of itself, subject to illusion, decay, and all the elements that make up this world, it is for sure unbecoming of one's greatness. It may be felt as if a prince is stuck with the sewer-cleaning crew, unrecognized for his status, forced to go through the muck, scrubbing away the shame of his predicament off the muck gooed up on the walls of the endless canals underneath his own palace. It can feel that way, and it does feel that way for a long time, but it is only until the realization comes to pass that it was the prince's pride that brought him down to the shame of his condition, not as a punishment, far from it, but as an act of wisdom gathering. Like Siddhartha, the main character in the Buddhist myths, he was a prince by birth, but he knew nothing of it. He had no wisdom about his own grandiose existence, much less about other potential existences beneath his. He was innocent and ignorant, but still he was, in essence, a prince. I will cease the allegorical comparison with the Buddhist myths here because the point of this contemplation goes in a different direction. But this single starting point is useful nonetheless. The prince is, but he doesn't know. And there is much he doesn't know. He doesn't know what it means to be a prince, except for what he is told it means. He doesn't know why his blissful existence in the palace grounds, albeit idyllic, seems unsatisfying. Also, he is unaware of his proud self-image. After all, he is a prince. So what he doesn't know or is aware of begins to taunt him, begins to bitter the sweetness of being, and he also does not know why this happens. So he dives, unknowingly too, into the spiral. He dives unknowingly into the house of mirrors, the dark lake of the mimic chameleon, where he will be subject to seeing himself in all his potentially dreadful and also magnanimous majesty. The visions of his unknown potentials appear before him, angry, dirty dogs, and they disgust him, for he was not accustomed to anything as gross, as unrefined. So he treats those visions as others, which in turn cause him to form unawarely, also a vision of him, also a dog, out of those potentials. His self-image remains. He is Prince, but now he is a mass of other baser aspects too. This causes a dissonance, one that brings about the first self-imposed bit of amnesia much needed for the experience of the metaphorical book he is about to read, because he needs to read it in submersion. He needs to identify with his own main character in the long story. And thus he starts his story, read with me and us and them, but all reflecting from the same unknown depths of the true living being who knows not what it is to be a prince and, soon enough, will also forget he is a prince altogether. The book is enticing, thrilling. There are twists, turns, important things at stake, things to lose and to earn, achievements and defeats. But the book's stories are slowly and gradually revealing to his essence all about his potentials. He was powerful and beautiful, but he didn't know what power was, or beauty. So he became ugly and powerless, enslaved by what lay beneath his own innocent and ignorant, proud self-image. The dogs that are the others, and the dogs that are himself. For sure, it was a milder kind of pride, a blissful kind of pride. 
But he had never met these grosser things that he didn't know he could also be and create. And they shamed him. And with each submerged vision, going from defeat to victory in each story read in his book of mirrors, his proud self-image eroded bit by bit. Eventually the downward spiral reached a point of singularity, one where he had no self-image at all. No dog, no mind, just void. Where he was no individual, no character in a story where he, nothing could therefore be happening, as there was no subject for anything to happen to. At that point a new self-image emerged, a newer dog, one that now raised from shame and contrasted with his previous one that descended from pride. As he came away from that zero point, finding a new identity to continue reading his book, the spiral inverted. It no longer flowed downwards, but upwards. He arose then, up through the stories he read in the book of his own unknown essence that had been making itself known to him, until he finally reached the middle point of the spiral, one, one where he could neither be proud or ashamed, where he was able to see all characters as he could see himself too. From that point, when he finished reading the book, he obtained the wisdom he had lacked as a prince, and also the full recollection of his essence as a prince. He emerged from the sewers not as the royal heir who commands obedience and respect, nor as the sewer slave who causes disgust and disdain, not as the hero who slew evil, nor as the villain who corrupted good, but as one who now knew both potential opposite combinations were him, and all the dogs he had been and all the dogs that had eaten him, came back with him. He returned to innocence and bliss, but now he was wise and he could now know also why he loved all those characters and canines he had met in the House of Mirrors, in the dark lake of the mimic chameleon when he read his own book, why he no longer rejected any of them. And as he stopped rejecting them, they were no longer shadow hounds in pursuit of their enemy, but rescued pups. And those pups still loved something to do. So he threw sticks for them, knowingly, lovingly, watching them chase them in excitement and joy and desire to please, to be accepted, acknowledged, and loved for what they are. For they did not create themselves. The prince did. The prince now knew, after reading his own book from start to finish, after leafing through all the potentials of his own infinite true life, to rule the throne with a bliss that was now whole and complete. And each dog, each pup that bit him or that he identified with along the way had been placed in their proper place happily dwelling in the fields as blissful as the prince's palace. And they are loved, not by a false love emerging from a sense of superiority that had decided to pridefully grant generosity, but truly loved as they are. And each dog had, therefore, been transmuted. Each dog had come home too, regardless of what it had done in the stories. They are just dogs, and dogs can also make themselves forget while in the plain where sticks are thrown just for fun, just for their sake. They looked now upon the prince and saw his beauty, as they had always seen regardless, but this time he didn't reject them. There is no more envy or resentment in them towards his abandonment, no rage to direct them. And his feeling of disgust and shame towards what they are was purified by wise realization. They had a proper place, a function now, 
and they who in the stories got the honor to be him. They got to bite him, to lick him, to nurse him back and to ravage him. All in the stories in the House of Mirrors, in the dark lake of the mimic chameleon, all in the stories reflected in time, all but a dream. Nothing evolved, nothing changed. No time passed, since there is no time in life and truth. Only that the essence of the prince now knew deeply his palace and his potentials. He now knew all the denizens of his own imagination. He was now the same living true essence, but wise. And so, he created happily ever after.